been asked to look at the question, asylum seekers, how do we balance fairness, safety and compassion? Let me be a little anecdotal with some of my own personal history on this issue. When John Howard first announced his Pacific Solution, as it was called, I was working directing the Jesuit Refugee Service in East Timor. 2001, as you could imagine, was a pretty hairy time in East Timor. Uh, a lot of the population had been internally displaced or were in refugee camps across the border. I'll never forget one night in August 2001, the word went around Dili, not that the cult from old regret had got away, but that Alexander Downer had asked Ramos Horta whether or not East Timor would accept 433 hapless souls who'd been picked up on the MV Tampa. I, as an Australian, was just almost physically sick. I thought, <laughs> here we are dealing with the poorest country in the region, which has the highest percentage of internally displaced and refugees of any country on earth. And this wealthy neighbour next door wants them to take another 433. Horter and his advisers were minded to do so on the basis that, well, Australia's done the right thing by us and they've asked a favour, perhaps we should reciprocate. It's just that the head of the UN there at the time was Sergio de Mello, who had of course been a deputy head of the UNHCR and he basically said over my dead body, he said this is just completely unprincipled. So what was then put in place was the so-called Pacific Solution. Now the Pacific Solution, whatever else might be said about it, was based on a bluff. And the bluff was, don't get on a boat and head for Australia because even if you make it here, you'll be sent offshore for processing and you'll never get to Australia. Well, guess what? The overwhelming majority of those who were proved to be refugees, who were held in Nauru, they made it either to Australia or New Zealand. And if you came from Afghanistan or Iraq, you were not a rugby player and therefore you didn't much care about the difference between Australia and New Zealand. You basically achieved the objective that you had in mind. Well, there were many of us, I'm sure including people in this room, who uh, campaigned long and hard against the Howard Pacific Solution. I was one of those people. I wrote a book called Tampering with Asylum. The second edition, 2007, contained basically a checklist of the things that needed to be done to wind back the Pacific Solution. I had a good sense of moral satisfaction when the Rudd government was elected and basically enacted that checklist. But what then happened? The boats started coming again. And they came in numbers such as we've never seen before. And now the ethical challenge about all of this. Let's make no mistake, as we move forward uh, to the time there in mid-2013, the rate at which boats were arriving in Australia, it had got to the stage where the annual arrival rate for the months leading up to July 2013 were running at about 3,300 per month, which translated to something like 40,000 or more per year. Now there was reliable intelligence available to government at the time, which was shared with people such as myself on a confidential basis at that time, but that it could escalate to anything 50 to 60,000 a year over the next year or two. Now, what's the ethical consideration with all of this? There are two in the first place. One is any nation state is entitled to conduct itself where it secures its national borders and where it has what it regards as a coherent migration policy. Australia is a country which has been founded on migration, as we all know. And in Australia's migration policy, there has long been a commitment not just to business migration, not just to family reunion, but to assistance with humanitarian cases. Now with those humanitarian cases, the quota which has been allocated each year has varied, usually from something between five to 20,000 per annum. This debate can get bogged down in statistics and we're not going to do that today. But the situation that's confronted us has been we're a net migration country, we will make some commitment 
to receiving humanitarian cases who will be permanently resettled in Australia, and over time those people would be entitled to avail themselves of family reunion programs. The second ethical consideration is this. Australia, being a good international citizen, commits itself, as it has, to the Convention on Refugees. And so, to put it basically, and a lot of legal academics will put in a lot of footnotes and a lot of qualifications to this, but the basic moral idea is this. How it translates in a globalised world is difficult, but the basic moral idea is this. Given that the UN was established on the idea of the dignity of the human person, where the human rights of all were to be protected, the presumption was, and the default position was, that it was the nation state which was responsible for protecting the human rights of persons within its jurisdictions. Now it was admitted by the international community of nations that there had to be one exception to that, and that was where people were fleeing persecution at the hands of or because of the negligence or neglect of their own government, that there would be a need for them to find asylum somewhere where their human rights could be protected. So, if you be in direct flight from persecution, even though you not have a lawful authority to enter a particular country, if you make it into another country which is a signatory to the Convention, that there would be various obligations that you would undertake as that receiving nation state. That is, that you would respect the human rights of those individuals. The question for us as Australians has been that usually we have not had people fleeing direct flight of persecution from the country next door. The exception has been the Papuans from West Papua and we've treated them abominably each time they've turned up. And it's still a blight on our national record. What's been happening particularly since 2012 is that the number of people who have been arriving by boat has increased and the moral question has been this. Are these people who could have availed themselves of a reasonable level of protection elsewhere before they got here and could they have been processed in a manner which we think is ethically acceptable? Now in terms of wrestling with this question I remember in June 2013, I broke ranks with some of the academic lawyers and all of this, and I said, well, we need to start conducting the thought experiment. What would be the preconditions in Indonesia for us in the future to be able to say that we would be entitled to intercept boats which were carrying Afghans, Iraqis, Iranians, who had come from Indonesia, what would be the conditions where we would be entitled to intercept those boats safely and with dignity, return them to Indonesia, assured that there really was a queue where they could be processed and where they would be accorded protection during that time? Now, to date, we don't have an answer to that question. But I think in the long term, that's going to be the only way we as Australians are going to find a solution which we would be comfortable going to bed at night saying that's the way to proceed. We've been nowhere near getting that, of course, because of the diplomatic standoff between Australia and Indonesia in recent months over the telephone bugging, etc. But Given that that was not possible at the time back in mid-2013, what was to be done? Given that numbers were running at the rate of 44,000 per annum. What we had was a situation where we had to accept that if the number of people who continued to arrive in Australia ran at that rate, then our whole humanitarian quota would be filled by those who arrived by boat. Now Bob Carr was very simplistic in the things he said about people arriving at the time, but it has to be admitted that a significant new cohort of those arriving were Iranians. And unlike the Iraqis and the Afghans who were there in Indonesia, these were not people who were fleeing a situation of civil war at the time, 
And they were not people who were waiting months or years in Indonesia. Some of them were getting through in a matter of weeks. And they were getting through by paying big money to the so-called people smugglers. So that's been the challenge to work out something that might be done. What Kevin Rudd did was come up with the so what I've called the shock and awe approach, which was to say, what we're going to do is we're now going to revisit what John Howard did, but because we can't repeat the bluff, we're actually going to engage in shock and awe, where it will be said, not that you'll be processed in Nauru or Papua New Guinea, but we now promise you will never reach Australia and you will be permanently resettled in either Nauru or Papua New Guinea. Now, why did John Howard not say that in the past? I think in part because it was acknowledged by government and acknowledged by the Australian community that it would be too expensive, that it would be unworkable, and that it would just be ethically repugnant. But we got to the stage politically as a nation where we said we are prepared to pay those costs. So what we've got at the moment in Australia is a situation where the objective is to stop the boats, and I am conceding for the purposes of moral argument, that there is some ethical propriety in the idea of stopping boats if you want to conduct a humanitarian program where you can be equal-handed, not just in terms of those who arrive in direct flight from persecution, but also where you can provide spaces, for example, under your program for women at risk in countries where people, women can never get access to boats or whatever, or refugees in refugee camps approved by UNHCR, people who don't have a cent to bless themselves with and could never access the services of a people smuggler. Now, in order to get some coherence to that, the question was how then to stop the boats now? And, as Philip Ruddick used to say, I was reflecting with this uh, with Martin before we came on this morning. I used to meet regularly with Philip Ruddick back 2001, 2003. Uh, we'd sit down every two months and work through details of what was going on at Woomera and Baxter. And the basic line that he used to put back then was this. Frank, you're ethically very well intentioned. We can only take so many people a year. There are 15, 25, 45 million, 15, 45 million people in need, however you want to assess asylum seekers or refugees. We can only take so many. Who's going to decide? The duly elected government of Australia or the people smuggling networks in Indonesia? And so it was this idea of being cruel to be kind. And that's still what we're confronting, but in spades at the moment. So. It seems to me that what we're confronted with is this, that politically both sides of our parliamentary chamber, and this was the dreadful thing that Kevin Rudd did in July 2013, obviously in order that he might have some prospect of being re-elected, but dropped that bottom line so low that of course there's nobody left in politics in a major political party who's in a situation to raise the bar any higher at this stage. And so what we had was a situation, July 2013, the bar put that low, where do we go from here? That's why someone like myself has not seen point in saying anything public very much about the ethical arguments until now. I said to everyone, including people like Paris Aristotle, look, you may as well wait six months, save your breath, because there's no one in Canberra who has the least interest in ethical discussion about this issue. All they're interested in knowing is whether pragmatically it can work in stopping boats. So it seems to me, given that's the moral paradox <coughs> we're confronted with, what's essential is for us as a community to position ourselves that if and when the boats have stopped, there has to be the equivalent of a peace dividend. There has to be some ethical trade-off given the mean and nasty things that we have done, destroying the lives of people in Nauru and on Manus Island, and the lives we're now going to destroy of people who we will move to Cambodia. Given that, it seems to me that if the boats can be stopped, eventually they'll only be stopped 
with an agreement between Australia and Indonesia. But if they be stopped, what's essential is, as the Houston panel recommended, that there be an increase of our humanitarian component from the measly 12,750 or whatever, at least to the 20,000 where Labor had it, and preferably to the 27,000 which was recommended by that panel over a five-year period. So a humanitarian quota of 27,000 per year. What will then be essential is that the 30,000 lives that we have tampered with and destroyed, we will have a moral obligation as a country to look to the needs of those people once those boats have been stopped. The idea that we have peddled, for example, that we took out a checkbook and said to Nauru that you will resettle the equivalent of 10% of your population over the next five year period. I mean, it's just cuckoo land stuff. And just think of the obscenity of it. I mean, imagine if the United States came to Australia and said, we've got a check for you here. You will resettle 2.5 million people in the next five years. Yes, thank you very much, we'll take the money. Or think, for example, of the situation in Papua New Guinea where it said people will be permanently resettled. Think how it's going to be with our border up in the Torres Strait. It's a very porous border at this stage because, of course, the Wontoks come down to uh, share vegetable gardens and do fishing uh, with the Torres Strait Islanders. Well, once you've got people who are said to be permanently resettled in Papua New Guinea, where they'll find no welcome in the local tribal villages, uh, understandably, they'll be trying to set out across that border to the Torres Strait. Or think, for example, of the situation in Cambodia, where the human rights record in terms of the protection of refugees is horrific. If you're in any doubt, look at the case study of what happened there with the Rohingyas in 2009-2010. I was involved at the time. You had the Chinese government coming to town with the $2 billion checkbook. They wanted these proven refugees UNHCR said it was the worst case they had experienced in 30 years of a government just flagrantly violating the Human Rights Convention. So we're going to have to clean up all of that. The next thing I think we should do is insist that our politicians bring the arrangements of Nauru and Papua New Guinea back before our parliament, at least for a decent parliamentary debate and for the authorisation of same. Everything that's being done at the moment is said to be done under the authorization of a legal instrument which set these places up back in 2012, not as countries of permanent resettlement, but simply as places for processing, where the understanding was people were to be removed from those countries as quickly as possible and resettled in countries including Australia. I think if we take that sort of incremental approach, we can get some ethical coherence back into the equation. Ultimately, the big unresolved ethical question is should we go back to the situation that we had prior to 2001 where I think quite properly we did not have a nexus between the number of people who arrived on shore deserving our, our refugee protection and the humanitarian quota in our migration program. What we did in 2001, and it was clever politics by the Howard government, was we drew the nexus so that everyone who arrived on shore without a visa, that was one less place for a woman in need in a remote part of the world, or one less place for a refugee in an African refugee camp with no access to people smugglers. And so if we leave that nexus question as one which is to be ethically considered, if we look at cleaning up the moral mess of the 30,000 lives that we've destroyed, and if we then get in place a regional agreement which involves Indonesia, Malaysia and Australia, where we could say, yes, decently, we could now intercept boats and safely return people to Indonesia, we might start to work towards something which is ethically more coherent than the present mess in which we find ourselves. Plenty of time for questions, discussion and disagreement. I think given that at any one time there will be 20 to 45 million people who are displaced, in part because of internal political 
disruption in their home countries, I think it is inevitable that nation states like Australia will have some national self-interest and foreign policy considerations playing a role in where they decide to give assistance and where they decide to hold back. The idea that there can be just a universal across the board approach I think is one which because of the enormity of the numbers involved I just don't think it carries. And so for example I'm one who would argue strongly that a country like Australia should show a preference over a considerable period of time for people fleeing persecution in Afghanistan and Iraq precisely because we committed troops in those countries and we exacerbated the lack of peace that existed in those countries in what we thought to be our own national self-interest or what we thought to be a service of our alliance with the United States. Now, I think they're relevant considerations in saying that we give a preference uh, which is over and above that which we would provide anywhere and elsewhere. Just wondering if you could flesh out a bit um, the aspects of your sort of incremental mm -hmm. solutions. Um, one part you mentioned was cleaning up the 30,000 lives that were destroyed. What do you mean by that? And the other is in terms of safely intercepting and returning votes. Uh, are you talking in the way that it's being done at the moment with the orange lifeboats and that kind of thing or something a right. bit safer? Right. Or, right. Yeah. Um, what I'm saying, in terms of the 30,000 lives uh, that for example, I don't think in the long term it's going to be realistic at all to think about people who have come from Afghanistan and Iraq permanently being resettled in Nauru or Papua New Guinea. So if we get to the stage, and I th my hunch at the moment is we will get to the stage that the boats will be stopped and it'll be done in a more cooperative way. I mean, it's just been announced this morning, for example, that the Indonesians are returning their ambassador to Australia. So, I mean, part of what's been going on, obviously, is that uh, the Indonesians have taken what might be seen publicly as a principled stand, but make no mistake, um, though Indonesia sees the people setting out by boats for Australia as primarily Australia's problem, Indonesia, of course, sees that it has a problem when there's an increased number of people waiting in Java, waiting to get on boats to come to Australia. So if you're running the government of Indonesia, you're basically saying to yourself, well, I hope to God eventually these boats will stop because it will relieve us of at least one problem of an increasing number of people in Java. So, I think that if the boats be stopped uh, fairly permanently, then I think we as the Australian community have to accept that part of the cost that was involved in that was the abuse which we visited upon these 30,000 people. And that given that it's no permanent solution, simply to say because Nauru and Cambodia are signatories to the Refugee Convention, that basically they should be left there. Because, make no mistake, I mean when Gillard thought about Timor, when Morrison comes up with uh, Cambodia, uh, all they're doing is hanging on to the fig leaf of legalism which says that these two nation states, which were basically created as what you might call client states out of a UN process, where of course to get your independence you have to sign off on every known UN convention. Well, of course you do it. You just sign them off and that's it. And then we turn around and unctuously say, oh, well, at least in Cambodia and at least in East Timor, you know, they're signatories to the Refugee Convention so we can put people there. I mean, it's just morally absolutely incoherent. So what I'm saying is that if the boats be stopped, then I think we have a responsibility to settle those people in Australia or to find places for them in countries like New Zealand or whatever. That does bring me though to another ethical quandary and Scott Morrison has mentioned this and I will concede this point to Scott Morrison, namely this, in the globalised world of which we are a part, there is no way the Refugee Convention can survive if the academic lawyers who argue about all of this say that the only way 
the provisions of the Refugee Convention could be ever complied with is by offering resettlement to people in first world countries which have the rule of law and complete freedom, then I say forget the Refugee Convention. And so if we're going to really talk about a regional solution to regional problems, we have to accept that if we've got genuine asylum seekers who are in direct flight of persecution turning up in this part of the world, well, there's got to be a way in which eventually you can say, yeah, you might end up in Australia, but then again, you might end up in the Solomon Islands, or you might end up just staying in Indonesia, or whatever. Now, we're a long way off uh, resolving that, but they're the sorts of issues which I think need to be addressed. Um. Coming back from the early year, I think it was last year, and being accosted by someone doing a survey in the street in one of the cities in Europe, they said, oh, Australia, that's a, that's a country that doesn't adhere to the United Nations Convention mm. on International Refugees. Um, the only comments about the way the EU, I know this is not perfect, but they seem to have a completely different approach mm. to refugee, um, I think the figures last year were something like 300,000 mm. refugees, asylum service, sorry. That's aside from immigrants. Um, have you got any comments about the way they deal with it? I know it's well, I'll make two comments. One is, I mean, in terms of strict legal compliance, uh, every time there's a case in the High Court, as there was on Friday, where there's a challenge to our detention regime on Manus Island or whatever, you can read on the net, I mean, very eloquent, detailed legal submissions by the Commonwealth to say, look, we are scrupulously complying with what is required under our obligations under the Refugee Convention. Now, there'll be disagreements about that, but there is at least an arguable case. The big, and you know, Martin could speak very eloquently about this, but I mean, the situation in Europe or anywhere else, I mean, what distinguishes Australia is we are an island nation continent. Now, that means two things. One is, there is a deep-seated national pathology about people arriving in boats and interfering with our borders. Uh, but the second is, there is the, there's the theoretical possibility that you can render your borders fairly secure. If you're in Europe or you know, even the United States, uh, you have land borders where there's no possibility of you insisting on the sort of uh, uh, effect that we can create in Australia of isolating ourselves completely. And so what the Europeans have had to deal with is just the phenomenon that of course, you know, people coming across from North Africa, landing there at Lampedusa or whatever, that of course they will spread throughout Europe and that their numbers of asylum seekers will be much greater than what we have here. So I don't know that it's to say that they're, they're morally any better than us, but it is to say that they have to accept a different reality. What I would say to us as Australians in terms of the morality is just because you have what you might regard as the benefit of being an island nation continent, this idea that you can isolate yourself completely, it is ultimately morally repugnant. Yes? Um, it seems to me that um, even if we do stop the boats and we get to the point of being able to incrementally improve the situation that we're in, there's still this problem of the frame that's been put around the asylum seekers as an issue in Australia. And, and for me, that frame was sort of encapsulated <coughs> by the notion of the queue. Mm. And it was very clever because it appealed to our inherent sense of equality mm. and fairness mm. and our defence of our immigration program, which is not challenged through mm. this debate, mm. interestingly, in Australia, it is in Europe, mm. um, but not in Australia. And so reframing that, mm. to me, is one of the big, I guess, mm public policy challenges. And mm. I'm interested in your thoughts on that because mm. it seems that that now dominates the public perception yeah. of the way that we're in position and it's mm. a very pernicious mm. uh, framing. Mm. Sure. And I mean, as I've tried to suggest, if there be 45 million people in the world at any one time who are in need of assistance, the prospect of there being a queue is ludicrous. There can, I mean, given this huge morass of um, uh, asylum-seeking humanity, I think there is the prospect of creating queues in particular places. And I think there can be some reframing in that regard. So, for example, the proposal I put in June last year, trying to do the theoretical thinking about 
when would you ultimately be entitled to intercept a boat and safely return people to Indonesia? I say, well, it would be if you had a UNHCR authorised operation in Indonesia where people were registered and they were being processed and they were being provided with places of resettlement and you could say, if you get on a boat, you'll be put at the end of that queue because there would actually be a queue. And if you got on a boat on a second time, you would be told you will never be processed. You will never go back on that queue. Now, I think that's got some ethical coherence to it, but at the same time it's got to be admitted that in terms of the morass of humanity we're talking about, there is no queue, and it's more like just a big pile in a haystack. Maybe two more or one more? One, right? one there and then at the back. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in what you were talking about, an agreement with Indonesia. Um, how we might arrive at it and what it might look like, particularly in light of what you were saying about, you touched upon about um, Australians viewing Indonesia as a significant part of the refugee problem, whereas objectively I think you have to acknowledge that we, we are causing a huge problem for Indonesia as the conduit. So without, without getting us to move to that opinion, how do, we, how do we arrive at an agreement and what might it look like? Well, this to me, it's part of what I call, you know, the, the peace dividend if the boats are stopped. Then we have to commit to the very detailed diplomatic work initially with Indonesia, but then fairly quickly it would have to bring in Malaysia, because Malaysia is the place from which they then come to Indonesia. And then with UNHCR at the table, I think at least if we had the three nations together with UNHCR, I think over time there would be the prospect of putting in place UNHCR authorised operations which ensure that there is no need and no advantage for people to move from Malaysia to Indonesia or from Indonesia to Australia. And that, as I say, would require very high level diplomatic work over a very long period of time. Okay. I'd be interested to know if, um, if you have any particular thoughts on how people who are concerned about Australia's policies can respond more effectively, whether you have any particular mm. criticisms of the way that uh, concerned people have been responding. Mm. Well, I mean, politically we're in a very difficult situation at the moment in that, uh, I mean, what we have is, if I may put it this way, the, the hypocrisy quotient on both sides of the Australian Parliament on this is through the roof. Um, I mean, if you're in any doubt about that, think about the preposterously unctuous things that Scott Morrison and Tony Abbott said about the idea that some hundreds of people would be sent to Malaysia, where they would have to just suffer such horrific consequences. The very same people saying, well, these people can now be permanently resettled in Cambodia. I mean, please, give us a break. So you've got that on that side. Then, I mean, what you've got on the Labor side is that, yes, the very party which stripped away John Howard's specific solution, and people like myself agitated for it and welcomed it, but then, when in an electoral fix, make an announcement which ethically was so far below what John Howard and Philip Ruddick had put in place as to be just off the table. And so what we're confronted with is that, yes, the major political parties and those who have been in office uh, in the last 10 years know that they have no ethical credibility left in order to deal with the issue. I mean, one interesting thing to watch, though, is like someone like Sam Dastiari, who I presume from the New South Wales right of the Labor Party, you know, doesn't just spout ethical propositions, but on this issue, he's already heralded that he's for change. So I think there will be a new generation of people in the major political parties who will be for change, but the present generation, they've locked themselves out of that. There's nowhere to go. So that then leaves us with the minor parties. 
Now, what I would say is that within the minor parties, one of the refreshing things, you might think it's strange to hear, is, I mean, you've not only got the Greens, who of course are predictable on the issue, but also you've got the DLP and you've got Clive Palmer. Um, Clive Palmer is ethically streets ahead of the Liberal Party and the Labor Party on this issue. Now, how that will actually play out in the Senate, <laughs> I don't know. And, I mean, I don't know him personally, and he's obviously a wild card. But far better, given the bankruptcy of what we've got with both the major political parties, far better to have three minor parties, all of whom have some commitment to a more ethical way of dealing with these issues. And I think that's where we have to agitate. Well, uh, last night I lamented the pervasiveness in a lot of our public talk of two sorts of emptiness. Moralising, which was empty because it had no concern with practical consequences, and practical activity, which had, was devoid of moral reflection. I like my moralising full, and that's what we've heard today, and I'm very, very grateful. <laughs>